Hello everyone, this is the first module of Lecture 2 which is on effective communication and problem solving. As with the other um, lecture, I have broken it up into three modules which I hope will um, be easier for you to listen to um, and have uh, an easier access for you if you need to go back um, to the various lectures. This is a very important topic and it is going to feed through into the other various modules um, of this course, namely uh, negotiation, your interview, the whole idea of professionalism and how do we minimise risk. So effective communication, uh, you can't have too much of it basically. So let's see what does that mean to us and um, how we can take that on board as legal practitioners. So first of all in this module um, it'll be effective communication. Module 2 is working with clients and in a team environment which feeds into your negotiation um, simulated exercise and then the um, reflection that you'll do through Spark at your face-to-face -face workshop and then finally models to assist with problem solving. I know you'll be aware of a couple but uh, there's a few more that maybe can assist you in that approach. So what's the relevance of the topic of effective communication as I say it's really linked to getting an outcome for your client. It really is all about communication, having an understanding of what your client is wanting you to do for them and that means that we need to dig a little bit deeper, we need to unpack what a client tells us to be effective communicators in how we ask questions. As lawyers what we love to do is funnel, that means we ask questions with a yes no answer, um, funneling down, taking the client where we want them to go. We need to adopt a little bit more of a broader approach and that is by engaging in effective questioning techniques so that we give the client an opportunity to communicate to us all matters rather than just um, what they think we need to know. Also bear in mind, and again this is a bit of a flashing light for you, the legal profession uniform law um, Australian solicitors conduct rules, again a bit of a mouthful isn't it, but we have an obligation to our clients, it's part of our duty to provide clear and timely advice, to assist a client to understand relevant legal issues and to make informed choices. One of the challenges when you enter into the legal profession is um, not taking on board the client's problem, remaining objectively and remaining objective in matters. I first went into practice in um, a suburban law firm, um, having uh, had an experience as a summer clerk in a, in a large firm and when I did so I did a lot of children's court work which involved care and crime um, as well as a lot of transactional and other matters and it was um, an early lesson for me to learn about remaining objective my area of specialty is family law and I think it has served me well to embrace objectivity as part of a lawyer's duty to the client. Yes we need to do the best we possibly can for a client but we need to be able to give them proper advice so that they ultimately are the ones that can make informed choices because it is their matter, it's not our matter and it's up to us to enable, to give them information so that they have that ability and it's sometimes easier said than done. You're going to join Daniel, myself and um, other staff members on the 5th of January in your face-to-face -face workshop. As I've said in, in the lecture one, it is a long day but my experience from students throughout the semester, it is one that they do enjoy. You're going to be involved in learning about negotiation, the, the foundation of how to negotiate and then engage in a simulated negotiation yourselves which is lots of fun um, and part of that needs your focus to be on effective communication um, with your fellow team members, with the other side as part of that whole process. It's also again very important when you've got a client interview making sure as part of that assessment task that you engage the client and um, have the client has an understanding of what you're talking about as well as an appreciation that you understand what they're saying. 
So there is a problem solving process that we'll get onto a little bit later um, in this um, module of the um, pro of this lecture. So I've got here on slide six, I always think this is a, a fun slide because as a lawyer it really does um, give a snapshot as to how things can go terribly wrong. How the client explained it in the first bit with a swing with three um, steps is very different to what the client really wanted which is um, still something hanging off the tree but this time it's a tire and you can see those various um, cartoons as to how it just got distorted by the various people associated with the process whether it was billing or how the client saw it um, how it was managed that's a bit of a sad um, sketch but clients are not easy and clients don't always articulate or give the right clues as to what they're really wanting to achieve. Um, I'm involved in a negotiation at the moment and it's very challenging I'd have to say um, and my client is giving me mixed messages as to really what he is wanting to achieve out of the process and I've had to have a very detailed and frank discussion with him as to um, the fact that I am getting mis mes mixed messages, mixed instructions and outline those very clearly as to uh, what he's saying, how he's acting, what he then says in a written format whether it's a text or an email and how that the, the various communication is not marrying up so I, I'm uh, very mindful of making sure that each step along the way we revisit well what is it that you're wanting to achieve because what he is explaining to me and how he's acting is at odds with other communication that is emanating from him. Ultimately um, we as lawyers are problem solvers and again I think it is a, an expression that is easier said than done and how to do that effectively is by embracing a whole range of effective communication tools whether that's our written tools, our, um, our oral engagement and our nonverbal. Nonverbal is a, a critical aspect of being an effective communicator. How we hold ourselves um, in our body language, our personal presentation. Um, it can even give a, a sign to a client if you turn up to a negotiation as to how you're dressed, um, how you're presenting as to whether you're taking it seriously in a formal professional way. Um, our oral communication again, being able to critically listen, uh, absorb and being aware um, of the audience. And the audience is going to be um, very diverse as you go into practice. You're part of the, some of you who are listening to this lecture may be engaged in um, audience that will have English as their second language for example um, other members of the audience that you might be engaged with will be um, professional people that uh, may be running corporations are used to dealing with lawyers um, or they, the whole spectrum of society um, will be part of the audience that we will be exposed to and be mindful of who your audience is as you are effectively or trying to communicate effectively to them and that goes saying with our written work I know that um, we like to write like a lawyer, talk like a lawyer and act like a lawyer and when um, you get to the plain language drafting lecture and workshop many of you will be challenged because all of a sudden you've spent all these years writing like a lawyer using long words, long sentences and then you get to the practical legal training aspect which says well we actually want you to forget about that, we don't want footnotes, what we want to do is actually focus on how you can write a letter to a client or to some other person being um, whoever the recipient is, the audience, in a way that is clear and concise and is able to convey the message in an effective way and I can tell you it's a real skill and it's not easily done notwithstanding I've been writing correspondence, affidavits, applications um, whatever form of written communication for a long time as a lawyer I still will look at a, a letter to a client, I'll redraft it um, can I say this in a more effective crisp, clean, concise way, can I direct the audience as to where I want them to go, what tools can I use to be a far more effective 
communicator um, in a written format. So have a look at this um, quote on pay, uh, slide 9. I, th I got very excited when I first saw that with Richard Nixon. I thought it must have been the ex-president of the United States, but it actually wasn't. But I, I, I liked it. I know that you believe, you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realise that what you heard is not what I meant. I love it. Um, don't understand it. That's why I love it. Um, it's all, all that gobbledygook. Um, but I think it sort of sums up how we need to be an effective communicator. It is in fact a two-way process and the next couple of slides um, deal with that. It's um, the ability of the sender to reach the receiver but also it's the responsibility of the receiver to um, clarify uncertainties, to use feedback for example to ask clarifying questions. It is a communication loop and to have an understanding of those three vital modes as to how we communicate verbal, vocal and visual. Even our vocal tone can have a real impact on how um, we communicate. So the sender is not referred to as the speaker and I think that that's another good um, tip for you to bear in mind. It's the sender of communication. So first of all, when you get into practice, there is a lot of communication, but it does take a, a variety of formats, whether it's face-to-face, -face, might be telephone, it might be in written correspondence. Have a think about what's the most appropriate for the particular situation. I've just had a, um, a message from the CEO of a not-for-profit organisation that I'm on the board of, and we have an issue associated with um, a person that's been involved with the... Um, organisation many many years ago and uh, that person has, has left a message for the CEO. The question for me is well should I just shoot the um, the person an email saying look you know I've got a board meeting next week get back to you. My response is now actually pick up the phone um, and speak speak to that person, um, deal with it, uh, be, be an effective communicator, um, find out very clearly what that person's wanting to achieve um, take a note, acknowledge it, and then we'll be able to address it, and that might be in the written correspondence. But this person's made a telephone call. Um, call them back would be, in that particular situation, an appropriate response. It's always important that you identify who's going to receive your message. As a lawyer, um, rest assured, as night follows day, the person that you write to isn't going to be the only person who is going to see your correspondence or a document that you might write or whatever it might be. I was told when I first entered into um, the legal world that any document I write I should think of as one day could either be attached to a, an affidavit um, by way of evidence and then come by before a judicial officer in some form of evidentiary capacity or worst scenario, it's attached to a complaint to the Legal Services Commissioner. I think that's always a good bar. So have a look at your letters. It's always um, uh, easy and tempting to write um, something and shoot it off that uh, may not really identify the message that you're wanting to communicate. What is the purpose? And um, bear in mind the receiver isn't just going to be the person that you might address it to. Um, Again, it is when you are um, involved in communication, sending is more than just speaking. Vocal intonation, um, how we express or feel about information, is critically important and people do pick up on it. Um, I might change my tone at various times during a client interview, particularly if I have a client that is in some distress or um, is having um, some difficulty or is experiencing some emotional aspect. I might drop my tone, get quiet, use far different types of, of words, um, have a softer approach than maybe other times in an interview depending upon what the subject matter is and what the client is involved in. So just be mindful of that about having a flexibility as to when we are sending um, communication and we are in that mode, um, how we can be effective. So slide 12 just has a graph of how message is received. I actually thought it was very important um, and interesting when you see that visual is such a big part of um, how a message is received. So people are visual and that's what happens when we negotiate. Um, 
use whiteboards, use paper, because people are visual, they can see things. And that's why documentation is often very important. So the receiver again, not a listener, but a receiver. Engage ears and eyes when communicating, providing feedback, clarifying messages. So the receiver has a degree of responsibility. It's not just getting the information and then not communicating back to the sender if there is something that is vague or uncertain. Um, again, that looped bridge. Good listening um, is essential to being an effective communicator. And um, slide 14 has four mental activities to concentrate on what is being said. And you might find uh, those useful as you um, maybe want to start practicing the tool of active listening. And slide 15 talks about active listening, demonstrating to the sender you've received the message in terms of the information, feelings and attitudes. Um, we all, and I, I'm certainly one of them, put up my hand for this, but when someone is listening, I'm usually formulating the question or I want to interrupt or I want to have my you know, opinion out and talk and engage uh, without actually listening to what they're saying. Um, summarising, making sure that you've got a good grasp of what it is that they want to talk about. This takes time and it actually is a real skill um, in the negotiation that I'm predominantly involved in now which is in the dispute resolution practice called collaborative practice and that's a dispute resolution process where parties commit not to go to court. Part of the interdisciplinary model of collaborative practice means that lawyers are working with mental health professionals and if there is a profession that knows how to actively listen it is the mental health professionals and uh, for me and every other lawyer that I know has worked in interdisciplinary collaborative practice um, the, the learning from the mental health professionals has been um, fantastic because their ability to reframe questions, their ability to um, engage in open questions and to focus on the words that are spoken and the body language so that the right message is absorbed is really um, critical. With the active listening, again, um, don't forget the pitch and the tone, body language actually just allowing someone to speak uninterrupted. Easier said than done. Just try and practice it next time. Someone in your family is talking or you know, an intimate relationship that you're involved in or a fellow student um, trying to say something. How hard is it for you not to interrupt? How hard is it for you just to sit there and absorb and just listen um, to what they're saying? Also maybe what they're not saying. Get some clues as to what else is going on. Because ultimately, um, there is a filter of message and that's part of our personal framework. We do set up structures um, and we have communication filters. They're often on a subconscious level. So we listen to things that we want to listen to. Um, we hear sometimes what I like, I like to describe it as is sometimes you just hear noise rather than the substance of what people are saying. So it is actually quite hard to sit down and... Um, communicate and focus and concentrate on what someone is saying. I certainly know my 17 year old um, just thinks I keep talking noise. It's just noise coming out when I say, you know, how many times, you know, how many times can I say, can you hang your towel on the towel rail? Um, it's the message just not getting across because he's not listening. Why is he listening? I'm not being an effective communicator, I suspect, as to why it's irritating me. So with that light moment of, a, of a, an example, um, that's the end of Module 1 of uh, Lecture 2. So have that in your mind. How can I be an effective communicator as we're going to go on to Module 2?